Thank you so much, Professor Bandera. It's a pleasure to have you here. So I wanted to start asking a broad question, uh, why economics and more specifically, why field experiments? Why this methodology? So why economics? I could tell you that since I was a baby, I dreamt about being an economist, but that wouldn't be true. <laughs> I stumbled economics by, by chance, because in Italy, where I'm from, um, as many countries, we do not study economics in high school. Mm. So I didn't know what economics really was, but I wanted to study mathematics or philosophy. And uh, economics happened to be kind of in the middle between the two. Yeah. And that's how I ended up doing economics. Field experiments, that's an interesting story because I actually was very fascinated by the, pro the possibility of measuring humans in a lab. Mm -hmm. but, and that's how I started thinking okay. about what to do. But then I realized that you know, really what makes humans human cannot be replicated in a lab completely, at least the part that I was interested in. Of course, there's many things that you can do in the lab, but you cannot quite replicate the, the social connection between people. Mm. Yeah. And so that's why I moved to the field. Yeah, I guess depending on topics, sometimes a lab setting is useful and uh, it's definitely enough, but not for every question. And how do you come up with research ideas? <laughs> that is the most difficult question, right? Because as I always tell my, my PhD students, it's not really about finding answers, it's more about finding questions. That's the difficult bit. I think they come one from the other, really. As you start thinking and researching topics, you realize that you know much less than you know than you thought. And this keeps happening. <laughs> Yeah. So you like you know less and less, and uh, and so you just go one after the other. But most of my ideas come from uh, observing things mm -hmm. and asking myself, can economics help explain this? So do you sometimes have conversations with, let's say, people working for government institutions or companies, and then try to think what they could improve, or does it happen the other way around? You have something you want to know, and then you cross institution and try to test it. So definitely not the second, because uh, it would be weird <laughs> to, for academics to drive real world <laughs> things. I, I think it's more a process of uh, common discovery. Yeah. Like because it's, um, you know, if they want to improve something, the, the difficult thing about field experiments is that often uh, firms or other organizations, they like to have a university logo on their program, so this program works, the LSC says, <laughs> and, and you can't blame them. Uh, but, um, but you don't want to do that, right? You, you don't, you're not a consultant, you're a researcher, so you want to find out things that are of interest both to the partner and to you. So it's a matter of finding questions of common interest. And good balance, yeah. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, uh, depending on the setting, it's better to do an RCT or an answer experiment. You, you've touched many different experimental designs. Do you have a strong preference for any of them, or do you base your choice on the environment setup? No, I'm I'm completely, completely agnostic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally not religious. I've, in my research, I've used every possible method. <laughs> yeah. So no, definitely not. <laughs> and what do you usually base your choice on? Uh, what are the key things one should look at when making this choice? I think again, you must be question driven. <laughs> And so you must ask yourself, what is the best method to answer this question? Like, I, I'm working now, I have a new paper on meritocracy. Mm -hmm. You cannot go around randomizing meritocracy. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe you can in small organizations, but that wouldn't be an interesting application because you want to study it at the society level. Mm -hmm. So in that case, we have a structural model that we estimate. Mm -hmm. So big driven, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are the biggest challenges that you have faced when doing research? The biggest challenge is always referring to. <laughs> <laughs> no, the biggest challenge, I think, is, uh, is twofold. The first is uh, to see the problem through the eyes of the people who are in the problem. Mm -hmm. So very often we see, I work a lot in low-income countries, mm -hmm. we see their, their conditions through their eyes, through the lens, of our experience. Yeah. And that messes things up. Mm. So seeing things from the right point of view is perhaps the most challenging. Mm. And when you do field experiments, what are the 
typical logistical problems or, or other type of obstacles that you have encountered? It's only logistical problems. I <laughs> think the experiment is just a mine of problems. <laughs> and indeed, there are so many field experiments and never see the light of day. Yeah. And yeah. which ones are the more frequent uh, logistical problems that you have encountered? I think there is an issue of uh, aligning the time horizon okay. between uh, you know, partners and researchers. Because it, understandably, when you see the stuff in works, you want to implement it right away. So many firms or government agencies, upon seeing the early results, would like to stop the experiment. But the long run effects are very different from the short run effects. So it has to be, one has to be patient. Yeah. <laughs> How would you suggest we overcome this challenge if you have any experience dealing with it? I, I think it is good to show partners the different dynamics not just for research, but for their own learning as well, because things change in the long run. People learn how to react. So say that you give a, a system of incentives that like we were talking earlier, mm -hmm. that relies on the cooperation of people. It takes a while for people to learn to cooperate. So if you judge the success of the system, say a week after you've introduced it, you're going to have a very different answer than if you wait six months. <laughs> yeah, so and in a more positive side, what would you say are the advantages in field experiments when learning how people behave? I think you see people in their real life and, uh, and that's, that's, a regular that's, one. that's what yeah. it is. The very difficult, the big difficulty I think that we all face is that we always do experiments at the individual level because it's much cheaper and much easier to administer. But a lot of decisions are not taken at the individual level, are taken by groups of individuals. Yeah. And, uh, and it's difficult to adapt experiments to that relevant unit of analysis. Um, yes, as, so as you mentioned earlier, your research helps us understand better economic activities, especially in low-income countries. So uh, how can we translate the RCT results into public policy? So that, that, is, that is not easy. Uh, but it is doable. I think it takes a bit of humility for researchers to go and talk, and because only researchers can do the dissemination of the research. So I think it takes a bit of goodwill and humility to, you know, yeah. to get off the conference circuit and, you know, say no to a seminar invitation and go and talk to policymakers instead. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so when, when having these conversations with uh, policymakers, are you aware of any impediments that arise uh, for policymakers that want to do evidence-based policies? Uh, plenty, mm -hmm. because, you know, many, in many cases, people don't want to find out what works and what doesn't work. They just want to do what they're interested in. And so you need to find policymakers who are as interested in finding out as you are mm -hmm. in helping them to find out. Yeah. And afterwards, when implementing it, do you uh, do you think they would be able to apply the results? Easily? Oh, much better than we can do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the context a lot better. Yeah. yeah. Um, so now for your son lecture, you're going to talk about the organization of labor and economic uh, development. So we don't need to get into a lot of detail because I'm sure he will get into a lot of detail later. But on a general note, uh, what do you think are the big remaining questions on uh, the organization of labor or even economic development? I think the big question is really to understand the interaction between people and how people cooperate. Because, you know, um, for a long time, economic development was mostly cross-country analysis, mm -hmm. right? You compare yeah. a country that has good weather to a country that has hot weather, a country with rivers to a country without rivers, I'm trivializing it, but the unit of analysis was the country. Then, you know, with the credibility revolution and all the RCT movement, we went to look at individuals and we've learned an enormous amount. But when the unit of observation is the individuals, a lot of things which are really interesting become endogeneity concerns. Mm -hmm. So we design our experiments to minimize spillovers. We design our experiments to minimize contamination. But these are what make economics interesting in the end, is how people learn from one another. Yeah. If you think about the evidence on firms or really any organization, you can control for the characteristics of the people that form the firm, 
and you will still be left with a huge residual. What's that residual? The residual is what people make together, mm -hmm. the difference between the total and the sum of the parts. And that's what we have to understand. Mm -hmm. So on a different note now, do you have a favorite paper among the ones you have written, either published or unpublished? <laughs> that's difficult, but <laughs> I would say that one paper that I'm particularly happy with, just because it was an idea that captivated me, one of the first ideas that I encountered in economics that captivated me. And you know, for like 20 years I thought, how can I test this? And then I had pro the possibility to do it, is uh, Poverty Traps. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's a recent paper that, uh, that we published, and I, I will talk about it in the lecture. Also, I wanted to ask you in general, what advice would you give young economists and young researchers? The same that I give to all the researchers, which is, uh, you know, if you want to do this job, you have to do it because you care about the questions and nothing else. Mm -hmm. Everything else is a byproduct. Yeah. Because, you know, if you choose a research question just because you think it's going to publish well or it's going to be popular, then you might as well go work for the bank. They're going to pay you more. <laughs> <laughs> that is great advice. Thank you. I, I think it indeed makes a big difference when you research on something you're fully invested in. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this was a great conversation and we're really looking forward to your stand lecture later today. Thank you.